Were you aware that between 1492 and 1820 that the majority of the travelers to come from the old world to the new world were of African descent? You'll learn that and more after this. Welcome to Living for Black History. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Smith, and you have arrived, as you guys know, this is where you get the best and the most present and the most up-to-date, current, research-based, historian-based history of African-American black people in the United States. This is the place. This is where we get the authentic, fabulous history that has influenced many, 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 many years, not just of the European-centric world, but of the entire world. Black history is everyone's history and it's important that you learn it. And so you come here every week to get this information and to get this solid, well-grounded, well-researched, historian-based information about black history. You're going to enjoy it because it's fabulous. So welcome. Just to let you know that this is a part of the Live For You movement that we have going on. That's why it's here on this channel. So what I need you to do is go ahead and subscribe to the channel so that you are aware when things are coming out. These come out weekly and a whole host of other things affiliated with this channel comes out weekly. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel. I also want you to like, like the videos. That gives us the ability and that gives us the, the visibility so everybody can learn black history. If you want more people to learn black history, then go ahead and like the videos and you can share the videos on your platforms, on your Facebooks and your Instagrams and all of your other social media so that you can get the word out there that there is a place if you want to get sound, historically factual information of black history if you don't have it. So go ahead and share the videos, like, comment, and share. Leave comments for discussion. We can have many dialogue about this. We can elaborate. You'll have access to the resources used and everything. So go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe to the video. Hit the notification bell so that you know when things come out. And things come out on this channel all the time, as I said before, the Living For You channel. There's the Living For You YouTube channel, which we talk specifically about life coaching and other things. And then there's right now, there's this history component that we're having here at this, this show called Living For you, uh, Black History. So welcome once again, I'm Dr. Larry, and let's get things started and going on. Where we were last time, we were in Africa, and we spent the entire first episode um, discussing the African experience pre-colonialism. Contrary to popular belief, Africa was not a dark continent. It was full of life. It was engaging. It was engaging in trade across the world with different nations from Asia to Europe, back in Africa, across Africa. So it was a mega component due to travelers coming in like Muslim traders, but others as well, as well as the local traditions and traders there in Africa itself. We talked about the great African kingdoms of like Ghana and Mali and Songhai. We talked about the rich resources, natural resources that were there. And we talked about their interactions and engagements with one another that existed prior to any European or any other outside colonialization of Africa. And so one of the things we talked about was the existence of slavery in Africa. And we kind of elaborated a little bit on that point for to make the point that slavery is, wasn't foreign to Africa. Slavery is not foreign to many civilizations across the world, most civilizations across the world in correction, because slavery is a human tendency. Slavery is something that we've been doing since the dawn of civilization. It's one of the oldest institution uh, human constructs in the world. And so we know that. So slavery was commonplace in Africa. And as you will see in the current discussion today, and as well as some in the future, slavery once Europeanized changed the dynamic of some things. Just as a key component for you guys who maybe are curious, one of the things is racialized slavery. 
Slavery in Africa wasn't racialized, just like slavery in Europe wasn't racialized, or in Asia, it wasn't racialized. It isn't until you start to see diversity in race, i.e. Europeans coming in contact with Africans and other groups, and that as time goes on, you're going to get a more racialized version of slavery. And it is that racialization of slavery that is going to create a difference, a major difference, because it's going to allow people who are of non-African descent to see African people as less than humans, i.e. treat them as less than humans, and perpetuate this thing of slavery that's going to be far worse than how slavery has existed in many parts of the world over the span of thousands of years as it has always been. So there is a difference. And that's the major difference. And so let's get into some of this conversation. Um, the reality of it is, is that European society as we know it, the kingdoms and the, the great movement around the world that brought European society around the world would not exist as it does if it had not been for the Atlantic slave trade. So this Africanized slave trade revolutionized Europe. And it changed the world forever and ever and ever and ever. It was the most crucial part of a time period in history that we call the European Commercial Revolution. Europe, remember, was late to the game. We talked about Africa. We talked about Muslim traders and traders in the East already being involved in trade uh, across the world. So there was already a commercial revolution going on well, 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 well into the Common Era um, after the first century. But Europe wasn't involved. Europe was not even fully formed. Many different nations hadn't come collective to have their own sovereignty. And so it really was still a bunch of kind of unorganized states after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, as you guys know. Um, and so we finally get Europe involved in this situation. And that dawns around the early 1400s, at the late 1300s, um, at, the, at the earliest. This is when Europe begins to start to get involved. And you guys know the contribution of that came from the Crusades, uh, intentional war that the Pope waged against Muslims in order to have access to the Promised Land that lasted for 200 years. And you guys know the Crusades were unsuccessful in its attempt to con convert the majority of the world to Christianity. However, um, the success of the Crusade was to take travelers and explorers and conquistadors and others all across the world to where they're discovering new places and establishing cities, like in Florence, Italy, and like Pisa, and other places, like in France. And so they're establishing cities, and it's economically beginning to turn around. Merchants are beginning to rule things, right? The church is also at the same time, interestingly enough, weakening its influence over Europe. The Roman Catholic Church had a strong European, a strong influence over Europe due to uh, Rome adopting Christianity and kind of solidifying that for many years, for over a thousand years. And so after a certain while, merchants and, and other people and nobility begin to dominate Europe, and Europe gets involved in the economic commercial revolution that we see. Part of this economic revolution is going to move European traders all over the known world at the time. And so you're going to begin to see trade extending to Asia, trade extending to Africa, and eventually trade extending into what will become known as the Americas, where we are here, the United States and the Caribbean and South and Central America. And so um, you will start to see Europe expand her reach. In the previous episode, we talked about the dominance of the Muslims um, and how they were dominating the trade and the economics in the old world, as we'll call it prior to about 1500. They were actually blocking an eastern route for Europeans to get to eastern trade things, as well as the promised land, the holy land, that they all shared, Christian Muslims and Jews, all shared the holy land. And so attempting to avoid interactions with these Muslim travelers, you're going to see Europeans who have a desire to spread knowledge, to spread Christianity, but as also, uh, most importantly, to get involved in the economics of the day, they're going to start looking for Western routes to get to the Asian markets that are so lucrative. And this is going to bring them down through, down through the West Coast of Africa by going south, right? The very first country to actually get involved and embark on this is actually going to be um, the Portuguese. 
The Portuguese are going to be the first to begin to move down along the western coast of Africa and move further south. Around 1400, the late 1400s, um, the mid to late 1400s, you're going to start to see that increase with other European countries. But Portugal at the time in the 15th century was the only nation that had the economics and the technological ability at the time, technology that they adopted from Chinese shipmakers and other people, Western and Muslim traders, um, are going to be the only country that's going to have the ability to begin to migrate and seek a Western route to the riches of the East. <laughs> Sounds crazy, right? But that's, that's how it started. And so this is there, due to better navigational techniques and technologies, Portugal is going to travel down the western coast of Africa and develop little islands, little island destinations and island settlements along the coast. Some of these places are like Cape Verde, Sao Paulo, I mean, Sao Tome, Sao Principe, um, that they're named after saints. Sao is Portuguese for saint. And they're named after different saints. And these are going to be little islands that they're going to have and take ownership of or claim in the name of the Portuguese king um, along the coast of Africa. Eventually, Portugal is going to be able to sail into the waters of the Gulf of Guinea, and that is when they're going to start trading there with African merchants and begin to create um, trade agreements with these African merchants within the African continent. And that is the beginning of when you start to see Africans being ejected, taken, stolen, kidnapped, moved about outside of Africa. Portugal is the very first nation to do that. The profitability of this Portuguese market is going to lead to other European nations because it's a major market. They're trading all kinds of things. They're getting gold, they're getting ivory, they're getting fruit, they're getting uh, pepper, they're getting olive oil, and most importantly, they're getting people as slaves taken out of Africa. And so it's going to be profitable so much so that it's going to eventually encourage Europeans from other nations like Spain, like France, like England to go into Africa and to obtain these resources. Eventually, human capital, people, black people, African people are going to surpass gold as being the most important African export. And believe me, it's going to surpass gold in a tremendously valuable way. There will be no, there be no more amount of money that can equivocate what African slavery was during this time, even in today's society. I always use the internet as a good example, how the internet involves everything, and you'll see that example used again. But it is a very, the internet is very powerful. I'm here on the internet discussing this with you, and it's, it's generating and it's being used in many ways to make money, to communicate. It's a very powerful tool. Well, slavery is going to surpass that and be kind of the internet of its day. The resource that is making resources resource and money and the development of many nations and civilizations in the Western sphere. After it becomes extremely profitable, um, around the end of the 15th century to 1400s, Spanish vessels are going to seek outside from the African sphere other, er, other areas to take over to spread the wealth. <laughs> um, and that's when we start to see the colonization, the conquest, and the exploration of the Americas. You guys know that Christopher Columbus encountered the Americas. I know some people have been taught that he discovered Americas, but before Christopher Columbus got here, there were well over 50 million people, Native Americans, who were in the Americas prior to Columbus. So if anybody discovered it, it would possibly be somebody, some of those people. And so now historians are more saying Christopher Columbus encountered. And if you know what I mean when I say encounter, he didn't know where he was going. His intention was to get to India in 1492, October 1492. And he wound up going way further west and bumping into the West Indies, as you guys know, Haiti and Dominican Republic and the islands surrounding that area. Um, never ever realizing that he had not gotten to anywhere uh, th that was familiar. He actually encountered something completely new to Europeans. And so Spain and other nations are going to come to this new territory that Columbus is going to um, encounter first as a European. Um, and they're going to use slave labor and slave workers and other black workers to help with the exploration, conquest, 
and the settlement of what they labeled the new world. Now, like I said before, there were well over 50 million people here, so it wasn't a new world, but for the European perspective, it was new. And natives had never seen Europeans, and Europeans had never seen natives. There was no expectation that um, they were going to encounter each other. All European nations had African people with them, with the exception of the English, right? The Spanish, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese. They all had African people with them, except the English, the English. Now, as I said in the intro, <laughs> the majority of the people coming here from the quote-unquote off old world to the quote-unquote off new world were of African people. Over 7.7 .7 million people that came here, which was the majority of the people, were of African descent from 1492 to 1820. Um, and they were, by between 1492 and about 1580, they were only about 25%, one-fourth of the travelers. But by the time we get to the 1700s, 1700 to about 1780, they make up 75% of the travelers coming into the new world from the old world. And Europeans stopped go coming in high numbers for a while. We won't see high European influx, and we'll talk about it in this class, but we won't see high European influx until the late, 17th century, late 18th century, late 1700s, going into the 19th century. The, the, the late 18th century going into the 19th century, the early 1800s. When we start to see an incline due to certain revolutions and certain issues and certain things like famines that are going on in Europe. However, up until that time, the majority of the travelers coming here are Africans and they're going to be coming as slaves. Um, out of Africa, you're going to see some 12.5 million people uprooted from out of their homes, kidnapped, taken away, stolen, ejected from their home of Africa, 12.5 million. And on that journey, which we'll talk about later on next week, um, only 7.7 .7 million of those 12.5 people, million people that are taken out are going to survive. That's a huge number. <laughs> and yes, that says a whole lot. You can use your imagination. We'll talk about it when we get to it next week. But just know that Africans make up the majority of the European travelers. So as stated, from the onset, Africans came with Europeans, many different nations with the exception of the British. Um, and even before the annual importation of thousands of Africans to work the New World sugar, coffee, and tobacco plantations, African slaves and free blacks entered the New, Lo New World alongside many explorers, some of which you have heard the fame about these explorers. Some of these Africans are also going to get fame and even their freedom sometimes for their participation um, in the conquest of the Americas, since they played a hand in helping the Spanish conquistadors claim the land and the lives of Native Americans. Now, isn't that ironic? Um, for example, when we talk about Ecuador, um, Spanish conquistador Pedro de Alvarado went into that area being the first European. He had 200 blacks traveling with him when he reached the capital of Quito. They were also with Hernando de Arcon and Francisco Vázquez de Coronado uh, when he conquered New Mexico. Slaves were also with Pizarro, Francisco Pizarro, when he went into Peru. They are the ones who carry his body um, to the cathedral after he was assassinated. Blacks also accompanied Panfilio de Navares on his expedition in 1527. Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca in his exploration of the southwestern part of the United States. Vasco Nunez de Balboa is considered the European explorer who discovered the Pacific Ocean. Well, when he crossed over Panama into the Pacific Ocean, he actually had Africans with him. And they saw it along with him. Hernan Cortez, who we all know in his conquests of Mexico, um, he actually carried blacks with him in that conquest. One of those blacks was the famed African conquistador named Juan Guerrero, Guerrero who was an African nobility, uh, noble, as some people think. Um, but he also traveled into other places, lived in Portugal, was uh, educated in Portugal. There are even pictures, as you see, of him here. And he even petitioned to Charles V for his freedom for helping in Puerto Rico, Cuba, as well as in Mexico. Uh, he was born around 1480, 
in West Africa, went to Lisbon, Portugal as a free person during his teenage years, and there he, was, he learned Portuguese, he spoke his African language, he spoke Spanish as well. Um, he was actually also at Juan Ponce de Leon when he went through Puerto Rico and Cuba and he encountered Florida um, in 1513. And of course, as I stated earlier, he helped Hernan Cortez with his army destroy the Aztec Empire in, in Mexico. He actually got land for his service and it is Juan Guerrido, an African nobleman, Juan Guerrido, who was actually the first person to plant grain in the new world. Now, how about that? How important is grain, right? If you think about the new world and you think about rice and tortillas and all kinds of products that we use here, it's a very important ex import into the new world. And Juan Guerrido is the very first one to plant that. Another outstanding African explorer was Estevan. Estevan was a slave and he actually went on an expedition with Panfilio de Nevarez in 1528. As they traveled through Mexico City and through other places, the whole group of people died along that trek, with the exception of a few of them. Um, only four of them survived, and one of those survivors was Esteban. And Esteban had an uncanny ability to translate languages on first contact. He can speak to somebody for a few moments, and then he can translate the languages between them and the explorers. He was invaluable to the Spanish conquests. Um, and then of course, lastly, and actually he was known by uh, the natives in that area, in the southwestern part of the area, the Sunni people, as the son of, son of the sun. Um, and he is because of his in uncanny ability to translate and to understand and his black skin. Lastly, you also have Africans who are traveling with um, the French as they come here into North America, traveling with French Jesuits and French explorers through Canada and through the parts of the United States that were conquered by the French along the Mississippi River Valley, one of which is around 1790, an African uh, French-speaking black named Jean-Baptiste Pont de Sable. That's Juan Baptiste Pont de Sable. He is actually the first person to erect the very first building um, in the city that is later going to be called Chicago. So uh, the Sable is actually, or the Sable, however you want to say it, is actually considered the founder of Chicago. The only group of Europeans that did not bring any Africans with them were the English. Um, however, Africans are going to work extensive, extensively and they're going to engage in the task of opening the new world for European development. So how fantastic is that? All of these well-known, these very famous European explorers actually had Africans with them. And these Africans did great things like De Sable, De Sable and Esteban and Juan Guerrero, right? Doing excellent things and kind of changing the face of the world, assisting and helping these Europeans in their conquest. Despite the irony of conquering uh, natives, uh, these people were involved in this as well. It's a great thing. Um, when the Europeans first came on their exploration, their initial goal was just to exploit the resources, right? They wanted the land, they wanted the resources in places like Peru and, and South America. They wanted the gold and the silver and other things that were here are plentiful that had been dried up in Europe. But um, they needed cheap labor to do the work, to work in the mines and to work on the fields and to plant some of the crops that were here. Because some of the crops that were here were not indigenous to the New World. Things like sugar and coffee and cotton uh, were not crops that were grown here. They were actually grown in what we would consider tropical parts of the Old World, like in Asia and in Africa. And so initially, what they did is they relied on Native American labor. Um, and they were exploiting the neighbor, Native Americans, they were cruelly treating the Native Americans, and the Europeans brought with them diseases that the Native Americans hadn't had an immunity to, that they had never encountered, and it wiped out 
nearly exterminated the Native American population. We know for a fact that within 100 years of 1492, when Columbus had gotten here, nearly 92% of the Native American population that was there prior to Europeans was gone. In fact, the Taino, which is a group of natives that come from the area where Columbus bumped into the um, Haitian, Puerto Rico, that area in the islands of the Caribbean, um, that population has been wiped out almost nearly completely um, at the encounter of Columbus and has not yet come back to existence as much as they were thriving in the millions when he got there. So natives were not more susceptible to these diseases and they were dying off. And so because of this, it's going to lead to an eradication and a wipe away of the Native American population to like 92%. Um, in addition, due to this brutal treatment um, and the Natives kind of being harshly, I mean just dangerously mistreated by the Spanish, a Catholic monk by the name of Bartholomew de las Casas in 1517 is going to make a recommendation that is going to change the face of everything. And his recommendation is going to be, instead of using and misusing and abusing and mistreating the natives, let's go to Africa and just get African people and have them do the labor, them do the tough labor. Now, mind you, it's a very interesting thing, right? Because not a lot of Europeans are, are coming over wanting to do the tough labor. So they're looking for a cheap, effective, um, easy to use resource or labor supply and they start with the natives, but then they say, okay, let's use the Africans because we've been misusing the natives. Now, you have to put things into perspective here. Remember what I said a few lectures ago that we, when we talked about how the Africans were incorporating Islam into their uh, society. And it was having a great, tremendous amount of impact and influence in American society. The great kingdoms, uh, Mansa Musa and others, they were Muslim kings. And the Muslims were also Moors. Moors were some of the northern Muslims, the Berbers, that area in northern Africa, who had made it into Europe. I didn't say this before because it wasn't really relevant to the American history experience to the total degree. But at some point in 711, the Muslims are going to take over places like Spain. And they're going to hold on to places like Spain under their control until 700 plus years later, like 1492, um, they're going to have a solid hold in parts of Europe. And the face of these Muslim explorers were directly from the continent of Africa, so they were people of color. So there is, there were black people. So there was this mindset that they're not Christian. There was this mindset that they were heathens and inferior. And so therefore, from the Christianized perspective, we can enslave Muslims and we can get Muslims who can do this work from Africa. And Africans have that. Now, mind you, this isn't racialized as yet. It's really specifically very much religion. But over time, it's going to become more and more as we get ingrained and embedded into this African resource for labor, it's going to become a racialized issue. And, and you'll start to see the shift as we continue to talk today. And so as early as 1501, we see Africans in the Caribbean being brought to the Caribbean as laborers. Um, and then as it continually goes on, we begin to see some of them come exclusively as slaves into the Caribbean. And you get terms like Ladino, L-A-D-I-N-O, which is an which is a, a African person who is Latinized, who lived in Europe. Uh, and they were used to it. Like I said, there was interchange and exchange from Africa into parts of Europe, especially places like Spain and Italy and other places. And if you look at people in Spain and Italy, and see some of the, the names and the features, you actually see a lot of African features, right? Of course. Um, and so they were already living in Europe. They had been used to it. But what was happening in Europe, and we've already talked about this in a couple of lectures ago when we talked about the feudal system. In the feudal system, the feudal system was a labor-based system. And at the very bottom of that labor-based system were peasants and slaves. But most of, the, most of the European people were considered what's called serfs. And we talked about that and served them. So, which were just peasant workers. And the majority of them were white. And so all of the labor that was difficult to do, all of the, the cheap labor that was difficult to perform, was already being performed and jobs were pretty much sold up by white people. So African labor coming into Europe, and I mind you, serfs made some resources, they made a little bit of money, they made a little bit of profit. So there was job competition there already that was full up with white people in much of Europe. 
most of Europe. And so because of that, free labor, as in the form of slaves, while it would have made sense uh, from an economic standpoint to have a cheap labor that is free, it made no sense for a place like Europe where you have a huge class, the majority of the people are low, low, low wage workers who are um, getting by, you would have revolts all on your hands. And even still in that environment where you're going to eject African people out of that experience, you're going to have quite a lot of labor revolts going on in Europe from the 1600s on, right, onward due to the mistreatment of the labor um, that is there, which are white labor. And so let alone to put in a full-on Africanized population to do that labor for free. That would just spur many, 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 many revolts. And so what we see is they're not going to be able to go into Europe and be solidified there. Even though there is African slavery in Europe, it's just not going to be to the level of what it is going to be into the Americas. Because in the Americas, in the New World, there is plenty of labor to be done. <laughs> there is plenty of resources and, and labor and work that needs to be done. And who best to do it? It already costs money to get people over. And so who best to do it than to, do someone, to, to give it to someone you don't have to pay? And that is African people. You don't have to pay them because now you're using them as chattel slavery. Remember, we talked about that before. As chattel slavery, you don't have to pay them. You own them, and now they can perform a free labor, and now it's about making profits and not necessarily having to pay people. It's a little more complicated than that. We'll deal with it, but just keep that in mind. That is, why, that is one of the attractiveness of African labor was that it was free and that it was plenty of work that needed to be done over in the New World. So as I said before, labor was pretty much sold up in Europe, sealed up. Um, it was in the hands of white people, and, and, and there was labor that needed to be done in the New World. And so people looking for an opportunity, actually white and some black, are actually going to leave Europe in an attempt to move to the New World in order to be able to come up in life. And one of the ways that is going to be most common that you're going to see is especially in England, but in other nations as well, you're going to see the indentured servitude system that is going to come up. And what indentured servitude means is that a laborer agrees to serve someone, a master, a landowner, a business owner, or someone for a term of years, and after which they will be given their freedom and ideally land to start their lives and kind of begin to move up the socioeconomic ladder. One of the things that is important to know about Europe is that land was sold up, already gone. There wasn't many access, much access to land in Europe. But the New World gave many people the hope and the opportunity to have access to resources. And part of that, that, that image, part of that ideal world came from the writings of people like Christopher Columbus and Ponce de Leon and Hernan Cortez and, and James Smith and a bunch of other people who had gone into the territory had seen and wrote back to their fellow people in Europe that this was an, a land full of opportunities, full of resources, a land of promise, creating as early as the late 1500s what we would consider today to be the American dream. And so terms of service became a constant irritant for all in England. For example, in the English colonies, the 13 colonies that you guys know, not only did servants chaff at having to stay until their indenture expired, but many of them went as far as to sue their masters and ship captains for illegal detention. Many servants would also run away and set up homesteads in unsettled land, making their capture and return increasingly difficult as well as expensive. Majority of these settlers would run away they had rights as indentured, right? Whereas a chattel slave doesn't have a right, an indentured servant had certain rights in the common courts in places like England and in other European nations. And so because of these rights, they used these rights, they vocalized these rights, they ran away, they'd done other things. And so by the late 17th century, English masters in places such as Virginia begin to talk amongst themselves as to how to deal with this indentured servant situation. When blacks presented so few difficulties that white laborers caused them, people begin to see color. Color played a very important role, which made it easier to enslave blacks. 
Africans could be easily recognized if they ran away and apprehended. Um, therefore, they could be purchased outright to stabilize, stabilize the master's labor supply. In the long run, Europeans argued that African slaves cost less since the New World colonies with their vast land area and potential for mining and agriculture provided the opportunities for amassing great wealth precisely because of an apparent inexhaustible supply of Africans that the slave trade made possible. In a period when economic considerations dominated colonial policy, this circulated around the, new, around the old world and this calculation made new world slavery a fixed institution. So it was easier to slave blacks than it was to slave indentured servants. And that ease and the other inability for them to run away and escape, their inability to sometimes speak the language, made them easy prey to be used on a continual basis for slavery in the new world. So wow, <laughs> right? Right? Africans are easy to enslave. Our black skin made us easier to enslave and capture and so many other things. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing when you think about it, right? Our very skin became our curse. And in their minds, they cursed it, right? Black skin, they, they equivocated it to so many things. They used biblical teachings um, to, to correct, to, to, to uphold what they believed. And it began to be ingrained in society about the African person. An interesting example of that, and that kind of puts this all together, is the situation of Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion happened in the end of the 1600s, really the 1650s, 60s, um, in Virginia Territory, which starts to set the precedent, gives you a good, strong catalyst of when African people became African slaves permanently. What happened during that time is both indentured servants who were black and white began to revolt, because what was happening is land was very scarce, the leader at that time in the Virginia Territory was William Berkeley. He was the governor of the Virginia Territory. And he had actually a very promising, good relations with the natives of the area. So he refused to get them off of the land to give that land access to European and African indentured servants. And so land was becoming short. Uh, there was also issues with wealth, wealthy um, landowners wanting more land. And there was a dynamic clash of the titans between the wealthy planters and the government. But in the middle of it were the laborers, the indentured servants, both black and white, who really didn't stand much of a chance, but they weren't getting what they were promised in these indentured contracts. And just so you know, indentured contracts last anywhere roughly on average between three to seven years. After seven years, you were given land or some compensation, and you were sent to your freedom to begin your life in this American dream. Well, um, black and white indentured servants revolted. They said, no, we will not do this labor. We will not be treated like this. We are equal citizens under the common law of England. And they're absolutely right. That's what English law was saying. And even some African indentured servants are going to get land, right? Even some of them are also going to get land, like Anthony Johnson in Virginia. And so um, you're going, and their own slaves and their own servants as well, just like that, because it was, like I said, it wasn't racialized. It was just a common practice. It was a status thing, and black or white people, we all like status, and that status symbol happened to be to own land and to have your own access to land, resources, and even slaves in this moment. And so, like I said, the indentured servants bonded together. There was an interracial bonding against the elites, the wealthy, and the government in Virginia. And what's going to happen is it's going to create a rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon, a land, land, wealthy landowner is going to get a bunch of people together galvanized to go and overtake the government of Jamestown in Virginia. Well, after the rebellion is squashed, what's going to happen is going to be swift, and they're going to say, you know what, white indigenous servants, you no longer have to do this. We're going to give you certain parcels of land, and that's yours. Go live your independent life. Now, you're, you're nowhere near the rich. You're nowhere near as powerful as the government, but you're part of this, right? You're, you're, you have access to your freedom. Black indentured, you're going to be indentured no longer. You're going to be servants for the rest of your life. That is your status. Based on your race, based on your color, you're going to be from this point on coming into this territory and into the Americas as slaves. And white indentured servants, you're going to be responsible for keeping them in line. So we're going to give you a task, a measure of power, authority over someone, as well as a little bit of land so that you feel connected to the power, even though you're nowhere near on the same level as the power. 
And that is going to effectively separate the races amongst those who have and those who don't have, beginning a cycle that leads even to the day. Um, and it's also going to create this distinction between poor whites and blacks that we're going to see last forever throughout this country's history that we will talk about as we go further into um, the discussion. So what about slavery? What was, what, what was the slave trade actually like? Well, um, European countries, whether they were large or small, began to embark on the African slave trade, began to start taking slaves out of Africa and saw that this Atlantic slave trade was going to be tremendously profitable. Um, they didn't have a good plan at first. Much of what they are going to develop into a well-orchestrated slave situation is going to be through trial and error, and then eventually it's going to be a little more systematic, a little more calculated, a little bit better organized and done. Um, slaves, they're going to create what's called slave factories along the coast of Africa, working with what they call factors. And these were, Afri these were traders in Africa and outside of Africa, European traders, who were trading from these factories. And they would just bring people to these islands, one of which is Elmina Island, which was established by Portugal around 1637. Um, and it got to be where you would have huge populations of African people and other people on that island. For example, in the heyday, um, Elmina had about 15,000 to 20,000 people on there. And a lot, you'll see what's happening, an interracial mix of people. And this is something you're seeing from one of the very first times in Africa, where you're actually seeing different racialized different groups, not, not, uh, or not ethnic groups, intermarrying, intermixing, creating an interracial population that's still there to this day. A lot of those people actually have Portuguese names near Elmina in that part of Africa. Uh, many things are going to be traded, many goods on these slave ships, but slave ships like the Heskish uh, and the, uh, that came from Liverpool and the Par are going to carry lots of slaves. The Par, for example, which came from England, Liverpool, England, is going to have the capacity to carry about 700 slaves um, and about 200 crew, about 100, two, 100 to 200 crew members on it. Uh, it actually is going to explode in 1798 off the coast of Blight of Birafa, Birafa. Uh, but it's going to kill everybody on board, including some 200 slaves that are going to be on board. And that was also a common occurrence that we've seen in these situations, that sometimes these ships exploded, killing everybody on board, hundreds of slaves as well. Um, a ship also is going to have a cargo uh, that depends on the season. It's also going to depend on the size of the ship. Not all ships carry the same thing, uh, but they're going to have various different sizes and ships and different cargoes that are going to be, in, be there. And how the ease of it to get slaves and take them is going to make either more slaves or less slaves for the travelers. And we know a lot of this information because there is an online database called the Transatlantic Slave Trade. If you Google it, you can actually see a lot of the intricate details about these different ships um, and whatnot. Um, but the factories had uh, friendly relations with African traders. They developed relationships between African monarchs and leaders and politicians and the African traders and the Portuguese traders. And they all worked together to eject people from Africa, right? And to, to begin to, um, to, to take people from Africa to participate in this slave trade. And so there was kind of a connection, right? There is this engagement that each nation, and, and including some of the African nations, are engaging in and getting people. So we have seen quite a lot, right? It's quite a lot that we've talked about, right? We've talked about. We talked about how Africans were there in Africa, already engaging in some type of slavery, wasn't racialized, didn't get racialized till years later, hundreds of years later, and then we began to see Europe seeking a western route to get to the east, like Columbus, bumps into the Americas, and that starts to, that, that, is an intent, uh, uh, that intentionally helps to expand slavery, expand African slavery, because there's plenty of resources and there's plenty of need for labor in the Americas. And after the mistreatment of the natives, and the natives are gone for the most part, they're going to turn into a traditional labor source that can produce the crops that they're bringing with them in the Americas in the form of Africans. And it's going to be a hugely profitable endeavor that is going to bring Africans here more than any other group to the Americas to produce these crops and to be involved in this Atlantic, uh, this Atlantic world slave trade. 
And that is how African people like myself, African Americans, black people are going to come here into what is called the United States, the Americas, South and Central America, North America. Now, like I said before, initially it wasn't racialized. But when you see movements and situations like Bacon's Rebellion, in which it's going to be a racialized division of labor, of resources, of power, that is going to change the dynamic. So when we talk about racism, racism can only exist when there is a racialized acknowledgement of differences of people. And the honesty, the truth, the historical accuracy is that no other countries other than England and Spain did more to create racism in the Americas than any other nation. They brought it with them, it benefited them, and they're going to use it. And eventually, as you guys know, racism is going to become an embedded system that there are some people, when you tell them that race is a social construct, they find it hard to believe that because they're so used to it being an inherent part of the societies to which they live. They live. All right. <laughs> so like I said, it's a lot. I enjoy it. You guys know I love history. I love talking about it. I write my nose down and I come here and I talk to you and we go into this information and we educate ourselves and we educate each other and we learn and we learn and we learn because there's no fabulous history that is, that is comparable to that of black history. So that's why when you come to Living for Black History, you're going to get the historical base you're going to get the historian-based, the fact-based information, and you'll have access because I will share all my resources that I have for you to get this college-level, higher education-level, powerful level of fantastic history that is black history. So once again, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. When we come in here next time and when we get in here face-to-face, -face, we're going to talk more about the African slave trade in Africa itself. And then we're also going to talk about the tragedy, the human rights violation, the difficult, arduous, worst thing you can imagine, hell on a boat path that is called the Middle Passage. And it, it, it is an undescribable, inhumane, psychologically damaging experience. Uh, experience. And, it, and it just gets worse afterwards for um, black people being taken out of Africa, kidnapped, ejected, stolen from their homes, brought to this new world. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, continue to come here when these premiere. You will know when these premiere if you hit the notification bells and you'll be able to watch it in real time. But always go back and watch it in your own time. Share it with your friends. Share it on your page. Let's create this because like I said at the very first video, there are a lot of people that I know, students of mine and other people that I know who do not have a, a, a knowledge of African American black history. And this is a place to get it and to share it along with other resources out there. So I look forward to seeing you guys. And like I said, all the time, I will see you all in the next video.